Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal, coming to you from sunny West London. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we are speaking with writer, anthropologist, editor, PhD candidate, visiting lecturer in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Chester, Jack Hunter. Jack founded Paraanthropology, Journal of Anthropological Approaches to Magic. He is the author of Why People Believe in Spirits, Gods, and Magic, editor of Talking with the Spirits, Ethnographies Between the Worlds, and the latest, Damned Facts. Jack, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Nice one, nice one. So I know you have uh, a, a new addition to the household, uh, a new kid uh, yeah. getting around. Yeah. So we're going to start with a childhood-based question, as we usually do. <laughs> Were you a weird kid? Um, uh, I think probably the answer is yes. Um, thinking back to it, when I was growing up, I I've always had a kind of I'd always had a kind of fascination with things like vampires, um, the paranormal, things like that. That I think one of my earliest memories is seeing. Um, a ladybird edition of Dracula uh, at supermarket when I was probably about four years old. And uh, I was just kind of hooked on that kind of gothic imagery for, uh, for a very long time. Um, so that's always been kind of a, a stream running through my thinking, <laughs> uh, gothic horror. Did your parents let you uh, have that book? I have, a, I have a similar story of around the same age, and I was not allowed to read Dracula at no. four. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't remember, actually. I haven't got the book now, so I'm guessing they probably didn't. No, the imagery go. stayed with me. So Cool. So, I mean, did that inform your kind of early experience of, of reading and so on? Well, yeah, kind of. Um, I'd always been intrigued by that kind of, you know, that kind of imagery, so I'd, I was interested in reading around it. And another of my earliest memories is having um, a big, like, world-famous um, Strange But True stories edited by Colin Wilson. And uh, that's kind of been, I, th- I don't know where it came from. I think my parents must have bought it for some reason, but it's kind of followed me around. I took it to university with me, and I've got it on my shelf now. And just reading through that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff just got me kind of hooked Nice, yeah, it's sort of a, a talismanic book there. It's, uh, yeah. I think I think a lot of people, have, well, I, maybe not a lot, but uh, parents seem to have, probably because of The Outsider, they have like one other Colin Wilson book that they're not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember that guy from that, so that's probably why we own this book. Yeah. Uh, and there's always one, it's either The Occult or, or something like that, mm. um, which is cool, very nice. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So... You had, I mean, from the very beginning, were you kind of considering academia as a career, like even as a small kid reading Colin Wilson books and and being interested in Dracula was the sort of, did the anthropology run deep? Um, I think so. I've I've had, I've thought about, you know, where the anthropology side of things came from quite a lot. And I think, I mean, my parents are really not religious at all in any kind of way. And I think um, growing up in that kind of environment, I it's almost as though I kind of like wanted a tradition for myself or something. And so I became interested in lots of different uh, kinds of traditions, you know, just kind of like testing the water and seeing what kinds of things are out there. And I remember in, in primary school becoming really interested in uh, Buddhism, although, you know, in retrospect, it was a very superficial kind of interest in Buddhism. But... Um, those yeah, you know, those kinds of like explorations into into religion. At one point, I became interested in Wicca. Uh, my friend's older brother was very interested in Wicca, and we did a few rituals and things like that. And I just kind of like dipped my toe in all of these different things. And then, uh, just just popped into my mind now, another big influence on me was probably um, <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Very good. Kind very of bringing good. in my vampire interests. Yep. I think. Um, you know, kind of like the character, like Giles, basically. I've always been like, yes, that's the kind of person I want to be. Yeah, well, he's objectively the best. Him or, yeah. him or Ethan Rain, anyway. So it's, it's like the bad Giles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so Giles is, I think even even now, like, 
I teach religious studies in a, in a college and I wear like a tweed jacket and a waistcoat and things. I think I kind of want to be like Giles. Well, and that's all right. That's, that's a good dream. That yeah, <laughs> keep chasing yeah. that one. Drink tea and say Americans dismissively a lot. And <laughs> yeah. the way there. And the other other uh, thing that kind of fed into that was Indiana Jones as well. I was always fascinated by Indiana Jones and the, the idea that you could be like a an occult archaeologist or an occult anthropologist. So when I went to university, well, when it came to time to to choose what I was going to do at university archaeology and anthropology seemed the way to go as a way to study you know weird stuff but in a kind of academically rigorous way and just to jump back to the primary school buddhist phase what kind of books does a primary school buddhist read <laughs> i'm not even sure i'm not, not even sure how it really came came into it but it all kind of kicked off with uh like a i became a vegetarian in year like in year six or something, um, mainly because of, I remember one incident um, at Christmas where my parents were having a, a, a duck or something and I got very upset about the duck. And I guess um, I was trying to find a, I mean, obviously I'm just rationalizing it now retrospectively, but I was, maybe I was trying to find some kind of a framework to make sense of that kind of thing. And Buddhism seemed like a, like a way to do that. You sure it wasn't the kind of um, big in the early 90s Tibetan Book of Living and Dying? Because I, <laughs> I, I went through like an eight-day um, Tibetan Buddhist phase after reading that around the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I did I did find a copy of that at, at a friend's house, and I think I've still got that copy now somewhere. Oh, you're that kind of book thief. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. So, I mean... What was, when you said it came time to sort of choose what you were going to do at university, I mean, mm. you've obviously, you obviously quite like it, you've, you've pursued a career in it. So what was your sort of first experience of academia in that sense? Because a, a lot of people are fairly keen to get out afterwards. Yeah. Um, well, the very, we kind of had like an introductory day. And it was on that, that introductory day that it really, I realized the potential for, um, for academic study when um an archaeologist who was in our department called josh pollard he specializes in uh, neolithic archaeology but he was kind of giving this introductory speech and he said the one piece of advice he could give us was to read widely and with an open mind and then it was you know after he said that i was like yes this is what i'm going to do i'm going to use my time at university to, to try and like read as widely as possible with as, as open a mind as possible and uh, see where it leads me and I started reading all sorts of David Icke stuff and uh, I you know I, my mind was pretty open <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, uh, but it was through reading that kind of stuff and especially thinking about like reptilians and things like that I was like where do these ideas come from like where does this reptilian idea come from and then and then I sort of I was trying to work out a way that I could weave it into my um, undergraduate dissertation. And so I changed it from, like, not necessarily reptilians, but where do ideas of spirits come from and why do people believe in spirits and all of those kinds of things. And um, so I, I decided that that was what I wanted to focus on. So was it a sort of purely intellectual interest or had you had some kind of, you know, problematic word, but you had you had some paranormal experiences by then that you're like, well... There's probably something behind this, and so I'm going to I'm going to continue looking in this direction. Yeah, um, there had well, I've had a few unusual experiences. Nothing like really major or life changing, but certain kinds of things. One of them, and this is another aspect of my of my youth, my childhood. Um, kind of around GCSE time, I first had um, magic mushrooms, and on the very first. The very first time I had magic mushrooms, I saw these like um, little kind of fairy creatures. Well, I thought they were fairies at the time. They were kind of like two-dimensional, um, kind of like if you've seen the uh, the book Fairies by Brian Froud and mm -hmm. Alan Lee, they were kind of like goblins in that kind of. They kind of looked like earthy goblin creatures, but they were two-dimensional in the grain of um, a chest of drawers. And they were kind of in a procession and they turned and they saw me and recognized that I was looking at them. 
and then they kind of turned away took no notice of me and carried on with their little procession and just things like that little experiences that have been like oh that was odd they seemed they seemed to be more kind of independent and more uh sure of what they were doing than the rest of the kind of like impersonal kind of fractal stuff that was going on in the rest of the trip and uh yeah so that kind of thing and then also i had a few weird kind of like hypnagogic um hallucinations of, of weird things like floating green goat's heads and stuff just stuff like that that makes well, you wonder no, no, let's just let's go back to the floating green goat's head if that if that wasn't a mushroom one where were you just like in tesco when did that happen no that i, I, I kind of woke up um in the night and uh it just seemed to be kind of like hovering over the bed and i had a few things similar kinds of things to that like um seeing big ships uh kind of like crashing over and things like that um while you're in that kind of asleep awake state yeah in a hypnagogic kind of state i mean i don't know i don't know what those kinds of experience mean if they mean anything but they're they're interesting and they suggest that there's something going on well yeah if if you've had those then you can kind of look at david i can go well where does this yeah reptilian thing come from because yeah. something is somewhere exactly yeah so was that i mean given we're, we're about to sort of embark on some of the some of your project projects since then but going back to that piece of advice on the first day of, of reading widely and with an open mind has that actually been your experience of uh academia when it comes to you know broadly 40 and topics yeah for me it, it has um, I haven't really ever encountered any kind of negativity or anything uh, with the stuff that I'm doing, which is good. I know a lot of people have a very different kind of uh, experience with academia and the and the paranormal, but for me, it's been quite good. It's difficult to get funding and stuff like that, but um, on the whole, I haven't really had any major problems. But then there haven't been too many sort of uh, vectors or avenues for the kind of publication or research uh, of it, not just on the funding basis, which is presumably why you founded uh, a journal of your own? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, basically, the way the journal emerged, when I was writing my undergraduate dissertation, I kind of just did it off my own back and wrote it, and then I went to see, um, we kind of were assigned a supervisor, and Fiona Bowie was my supervisor, an anthropologist. Um, I'd had her for my anthropology of religion modules and cosmology cos- uh, modules for my degree. And she was my supervisor for this. So I basically just kind of like handed her this uh, dissertation on spirit mediumship. Um, oh, I haven't even explained how I came to find this group that I researched. Oh, were- yeah. Well, yeah. Um- We'll get to that immediately after this. <laughs> okay, yeah. So <laughs> I handed tuned. her this, uh, this dissertation and uh, she said, oh, I'm really interested in uh, spirit mediumship and I'm just in the process of setting up a kind of informal research group called the Afterlife Research Centre uh, based in Bristol at the time. And she had a couple of PhD students who were researching spirit mediumship in different cultural contexts. I was like, oh, this is brilliant. And Fiona said, would you like to get involved? So I was like, yeah, I'll get involved. So it kind of the journal Paranthropology kind of emerged out of that because we had a few discussions about the need for a, a journal uh, that deals with these kinds of things from an anthropological spec- perspective and one that's based kind of based in the UK as well because there are obviously there's journals for like the Society for Psychical Research in the UK but that's about it as far as maybe the the ASAP journal as well as far as kind of like academic paranormal studies. And in the US, they've got the Journal of the Parapsychological Association and the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness. But there isn't, wasn't anything in the UK. So I thought, well, instead of waiting around for someone else to set one up, I'll just do it myself. Nice. nice. And uh, that's how it, it kind of got like spiraled out of control from there. Spiraled out of control. In a well, nice way. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> spiraled upwards out of control. Yeah. All right, so actually, the um, the story of the the mediumship thing is uh, is definitely worth picking up on because you you studied at Bristol, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still there now. Oh, I don't live there anymore. 
Um, yeah, so I started off with this reptilian thing. Where, do repti- where does this reptilian idea come from? And then I was like, well, where do spirits come from? And I was trying to think of a way of that I could do my dissertation around that kind of a theme. Um, so the obvious choice seemed to be to find people who kind of regularly uh, interact with spirits. So I started to visit a, um, a spiritualist church in Bristol. And uh, it was an interesting experience. And I had um, a, couple of, a couple of occasions the medium selected me out of the audience to give me readings. And that was a, a strange experience in itself. It kind of, you kind of feel like you're transparent and they're picking out uh, little bits of information that even you're not uh, aware of yourself. So they gave me little bits of information that I later confirmed um, with other people. But because, or for, from my experience, because of the nature of these kinds of uh, churches, they have a very uh, kind of, in my experience anyway, fluctuating uh, congregations. So like one person might go in there one day um, because they they feel like they're uh, interested in the topic and they they just want to see what it's like. Another person might go in the next day because they want to make contact with their dead loved one or whatever. Um, and then they might not come back again the next day or the next week or whatever. Um, so it was, it was quite difficult for me to kind of pin people down to get interviews with them and uh, to kind of build up a, a rapport and talk about the kinds of things that I wanted to talk about. So it, that almost for me turned into a kind of a dead end. Um, so I started looking on the internet trying to find like more kind of... Um, private home circle kind of groups where I could, you know, go regularly and and get to know the people in the group. And then uh, just very fortunately, really, I stumbled across uh, the Bristol Spirit Lodge, which turned out to be just literally a 10 minute walk from where I was living. Uh, So that's how I discovered this group. And um, I got involved with them. Um, And it's, again, it's kind of like spiraled out of control since then. (laughs) So, I mean, what was the first experience with with the group like? I mean, when you you showed up and you didn't know anyone, Mm -hmm. tell us about that. Yeah. Well, the very first time I went there, um, it kind of challenged some of my assumptions about uh, mediumship and uh, spiritualism and all these kinds of things. The first thing that I found out found quite interesting was that the seance was actually conducted during the day. Um, so usually, you know, you think of seances and it's nighttime and it's all gothic and stormy. But on this day, it actually snowed. Everywhere was kind of like glistening white and crisp. And I walked up to the lodge and I was kind of like, I was very nervous, really, because I didn't know what to expect. And I was kind of half thinking that I was going to see something that was going to totally blow my mind, like in a real extravagant way. Um, But actually, it was a lot more uh, kind of subtle, the experiences. Everyone was very nice. We had a chat beforehand, and then we went out to this, uh, the shed, which was the lodge. And um, the medium there, female medium, she sat in the cabinet. Uh, So yeah, it's kind of like a traditional Victorian style seance with a a cabinet with a chair in the middle and uh, everyone sits around uh, in a circle around the outside and they played kind of like uh, kind of like new age music um, and invited everyone to kind of relax and they did an opening prayer and I could see the medium beginning to kind of look a little bit agitated like she was shuffling around a little bit and lifting her legs up and stretching out in strange ways and then Eventually, her main uh, spirit control came through and introduced himself to us. And it was, you know, it felt like a kind of, kind of like a kind of primal experience. It was, it felt really uh, shamanic and kind of really human as well. It's like everyone was gathered together to, to talk with the oracle kind of thing. So that was an interesting experience. And then there were other things that started to happen as well. Like I would see little uh, like flashes of light behind the medium in the cabinet. Just little like white flashes or little green flashes. Um, And I couldn't really tell whether these were 
objective flashes or subjective flashes. I couldn't tell whether I was imagining them or whether they were actually happening. And then I also saw this kind of like green face, uh, kind of like a, I suppose, kind of like a stereotypical Chinese monk kind of face. And this face kind of like appeared over the mediums and then it kind of like slid down, slipped down and disappeared. And I later learned that, you know, this is what they call transfiguration. And actually, the mediums at the lodge spend a lot of time trying to develop these kinds of things. But I saw this anyway, and I couldn't tell whether it was real or unreal or whatever. Um, and I kind of kept it to myself. And then afterwards, when we went out, uh, back out of the lodge, back into the house to have a cup of tea and cake and, and talk about what we'd seen, other people said that they'd seen the same thing. and I hadn't even mentioned it yet. So it was kind of like it added this extra layer, like these kinds of seemingly subjective hallucinations that other people were also picking up on. Um, and it just kind of, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like I'd seen something really hardcore and weird that totally freaked me out, but it was subtly suggesting that there was something more going on here. Um, it kind of suggested at the very least that for people who do participate in, in seances and things, you can have uh, strange experiences. doesn't matter whether they are internal experiences or external phenomena. Um, the fact is that the con- you know these conditions are just right for allowing people to have certain kinds of weird experiences. And that, again, opened the flood barriers and... Um, it gave me something to kind of grasp onto this experiential aspect of it. And so, I mean, that was session number one where they sort of similarly yeah. interesting. Uh, I mean, th- that level of, uh, they weren't all that fascinating. No, <laughs> A lot of the time it was just kind of like, um, you wouldn't see any kind of anything. Uh, you'd just be talking with spirits about various different things. Um, and it can get a little bit boring, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, it's just the way it goes. No, true. Uh, and I mean, was the group aware that you were? Uh, I mean, your initial interest may have been personal, but you were you were there to for essentially research. Yeah, they knew that. Yeah, um, I, I've been. I was upfront about that from the beginning, um, and it, it kind of. I think it kind of worked. In a way, it was kind of good, and in a way, it was kind of bad. Because, in a sense, they kind of treated me as almost kind of like a a scientific observer in a way, so I could kind of verify things that happened. Although that wasn't really my role as an anthropologist there, but that's kind of the way they treated me a little bit. Um, so, it probably had something of an effect on on the way I was, you know, participating in the group. Kind of well, I guess with most most anthropologists, you're kind of like half in the group and half out of the group. But yeah, they they knew I was a researcher. No, oh, cool. Well, you sort of touched on something there, which sort of segues neatly into the next topic, which is the the kind of role of an anthropologist or the role of uh, anyone. I, I guess from a, a looking at the world with the sort of broad lens of uh, of, of Western academic uh, glasses. And uh, I presume out of Power Anthropology came Talking with the Spirits, the, yeah. the collect- your first edited collection, I believe? It is, yeah. Um, yeah, that book emerged at exactly the same time as the journal, but it took years to actually <laughs> come to fruit. But I think actually the book started off before the journal, uh, I I was interested in getting a kind of cross-cultural perspective on mediumship. So I sent emails out to various different people who I thought would be interested in contributing. And um, and they were. But it didn't you know, come to fruit until, I think, when was it? 2014 that it actually came out. So it took four years to actually emerge while the journal was kind of pumping out quarterly. Sure. So, yeah. Well, I mean, what I liked, well, I liked a bunch of things about it, but what I thought was quite interesting is not only is, not only does it kind of explore 
uh, I guess, Western spirit modalities. But I think my favorite essay, or the one that stuck with me, was about the Cuban espiritismo. Yes. Because, uh, I mean, this is there's no kind of unclunky way of saying this, but there is a, a kind of Western European expectation that the, um, I guess, the role of the spirits or the function of spirits within culture is somewhat cleaner in, in places like uh, Cuba or Brazil, where it, it is a bit more vibrant. But I found that one really interesting that some of the uh, sort of spirit engagements in the essay were with people who were just entirely secular, just as if they lived in West London or, or wherever. Yeah. And, and that, uh, for me, that's, that's quite, re that's really stuck with me, because it kind of widens out the discussion of, of the role of things like anthropological analysis or, or mm -hmm. observation, uh, kind of, well, it it, re it widens it out, but it, it repositions its context so that it's not kind of a. You cannot say the uh, an anthropological view is an exclusively Western one. It's it, it's it's its own thing. It's it's a way of seeing the world yeah. that kind of fits in different cultures in different ways. And so yeah. I thought that essay was fantastic. It was, yeah. That's uh, Diana Spirito Santo. She's done so. She uh, all of her, all of her writing and research is amazing. I think it's really pushing the envelope um but yeah i agree like this whole just i don't know whether i'm going off on a tangent but no tangents are great <laughs> yeah tangent thinking away. about thinking about um like western ideas about spirits and things like that and the, the role of anthropology and all these kinds of things um one of the like my research uh with spirit spirit mediumship and with spirits has been based in a in a kind of like western context Okay, so literally in suburban Bristol, and I think that's one of the re like one of the reasons why there actually is such a a kind of drought of um, of, of research into Western uh, spirit mediumship because anthropology is usually being concerned with like non-Western cultures. It's usually kind of put built up a kind of uh, barrier between Western and non-Western. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so it's been kind of cautious about thinking about these kinds of things actually happening here. I think it really goes back to, like, it's anthropology basically shaking off its old Victorian evolutionist Yeah, uh, like approaches. Dr. Livingston, I presume, kind of. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and all of that E.B. Tyler stuff. So I've been writing, I've written quite a lot about that kind of thing as well. But what I, what I really wanted to do was show that they're, with talking with the spirits, like you have these Western traditions, these non-Western traditions, and showing that, although, you know, obviously they're not identical and it would be way too simplistic to say that the same, that they are the same thing that's going on. But what I've kind of picked up out of it is that there are kind of similar processes that are going on. Yeah. Um, Cross-culturally. And it, it brings it back to this, like uh, like I was saying before, this experiential aspect, uh, like David Hufford's um, experiential source hypothesis. This is kind of, that's kind of like the the bedrock of the work that I do. Really, it's the idea that there is there are these kind of experiential processes that um, underlie these traditions. Yes, and it's a really and I, I can see we're both going to stumble over the words because it's actually quite a challenging thing to convey without you know, talking about universalism or, 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 yeah. or any of that kind of thing, because kind of baked into a, a, an almost phenomenological perspective of mm -hmm. the world and culture is the uh, assertion that there is some kind of, you know, ontological facts or categories behind mm -hmm. shared experiences of humans. So you kind of have to go... Um, Yes, caveat, caveat, no cultural insensitivity, blah, 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 <laughs> and then, and then try and, and talk about it. And it's, it's, I think an indication of, what well, one, it's a positive indication of, of culture and academia that these discussions are having, but it's also an indication of, of health and the newness of the discourse that it is quite challenging to start with. So we, we don't, yeah. we, we don't fall into historic traps. No, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely a new kind of, way of thinking about things or it has a potential to be yeah well yeah. this again we're we're 
we're just teeing these ones up. It kind of brings up the uh, the latest book, which I absolutely love, called The Dam. So I'm going to ask you question one, just on the yeah. topic we were just discussing. What are the X-Files of the humanities, and how <laughs> may we all join the shit out of that? Okay. <laughs> the X-Files of the humanities, that's basically, well, it's my vision for what anthropology and things like religious studies could be if we were willing to kind of uh, it's tied up with this idea of ontological flooding that I've been experimenting with if we're willing to kind of give up our certainty in a way that western academia uh, that, that western science has kind of already sorted everything out, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, so if we were able to engage with these things on a kind of a level playing playing field where everything is and it's also tied in with Fort's ideas of intermediatism which we'll get to yeah, yeah. Uh, where everything is kind of equally unreal and equally real um, then we could you know there's a there's a huge scope of things that we could be uh, exploring and the X-Files of the Humanities is is my idea of of what this could look like and I, that's kind of what the book Damn in Fact was meant to be about it, it originally started as um, what would a kind of Fortean religious studies look like. So I was trying to collect essays that would uh, that would explore this idea and kind of flesh it out a little bit. Well, I th- I think the time for it's come. I was on uh, the Hermetic Hour podcast uh, the other week uh, with mm-hmm. Poe Grunion, and he was saying because he's um, an older gentleman now, but. Uh, he was saying when he was doing cultural anthropology, he suggested there should be like an international anomalous department. Yeah, uh, and it did not go well. It, the, no. the time, <laughs> the time was not yet uh, for such an idea. But uh, yeah. you touched on um, Charles Fort and uh, intermediatism. Mm-hmm. So, who is Charles, or who was Charles Fort, and what yeah. is intermediatism? Okay, well, Charles Fort was. Um a writer, he was kind of writing late uh, 1800s. He started kind of writing novels. And then I think 1919, he published his first book, The Book of the Damned. And it's basically a collection of all sorts of weird accounts of uh, things like fish falling from the sky or objects appearing unexpectedly in, in places where they shouldn't be and things like that. Then the interesting thing is he collected all of these accounts from um, scientific journals and newspapers and things like that. So he was trying to find the kind of best evidence for weird stuff. And he was presenting it all kind of like, like I was saying before, as a kind of challenge to uh, scientific certainty, saying that, look, all of this weird stuff is going on. um, And we just haven't got, we don't know, you know, anything about it. We haven't got any kind of a model to explain how it happens. Um, and it challenges the the established models that we do have. Uh, so Charles Fort, yeah, he's a real cool guy. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, one, it, he, he's actually a very good read even now. Like, it, it, yeah. it's, it's entertaining stuff to read. But he also... Um, a, a lot of the the pieces he found, as you say, some of it was in scientific journals. So there's some kind of cognitive dissonance of these... Uh, experiences that fall outside the model just vanish from people's heads even yeah. and, and that that has always frustrated me because it by definition it means that um the model isn't really up to code if mm-hmm. if it can't model things you know yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly so i mean one of his one of his concepts uh where well, he he kept a lot of them at arm's length but uh mm-hmm. intermediatism is yeah yes yeah. so um his this is basically his method of kind of accommodating all of these crazy uh, disparate kinds of things and it was basically a whole new kind of i guess a whole new way of thinking about reality uh, that sounds very <laughs> very big and vague but i guess it kind of that is what he was talking about and basically the way i think of it he was thinking in terms of kind of like a sliding scale of reality so whereas normally in in kind of western thinking we split things up into like uh dichotomies like real or unreal or alive and dead things like that binary oppositions 
Fort had he developed this kind of intermediatist way of um, of escaping from that dualism, and basically it was to say that everything that exists exists on this sliding scale between realness and unrealness. So everything is already on the same playing field, kind of like what I was saying before. Um, so even the strangest, the strangest, most unreal seeming things are still on the spectrum, you know, between the real and the unreal, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, I mean, he had, a, he had a lot of sort of spectrum things. I think if we sort of talk about things like the, the transmediumization idea, where yeah. um, I think, actually, now I've got the quote in front of me, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh I mean, not the action of mind upon matter, but the action yeah. of mind matter upon matter mind. Yeah. So he's trying to deploy, um, yeah, a, a sort of spectrum idea rather than a, a binary one to to attempt to model some of the experiences, like seeing a you know a semi translucent um, Chinese monk face in green yeah. in in like a backyard in Bristol. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good example. <laughs> <laughs> you should write that down somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's it. I mean, I guess if I I could apply this kind of Fortean transmediumization idea to that experience, I hadn't really thought of that before. It's kind of like a breakdown of the subjective objective dichotomy. Like there's something that is somewhere in between, inside and outside. There's no it's more blurry and, and strange than we usually take, you know, we usually assume it is. Yeah, he didn't He didn't seem to be a fan of binaries. I mean, he kind of no. said religion and science were the same thing because, yeah. you know, um, one of them is, like, they, they are binary. Like, it's a, it's a on-off, like, supreme being or not um, yeah. idea. And it, it appears just experientially and from his research that, Yes, uh, reality is is more spectrum like. Yeah, more sliding scale kind of thing. And I th- I think that like if we were able to introduce this kind of intermediatist way of thinking about things into uh, academia, this is where I this like X Files of the Humanities could could emerge. Like we could begin to engage with these things that we'd previously um, you know split off said these things are not real they're things that we don't we can't talk about seriously and put them on this this spectrum and actually engage with them so this is your ontological flooding it is basically this idea of ontological flooding yeah <laughs> so the idea of ontological flooding i've had some discussions with with people on facebook about it and i admit that i haven't worked out all of the uh you know the finer details and the implications and what would it actually be like if this did come, you know, if, if this was a real tool that we could use, but I think it's a useful starting point. So the idea emerged from, um, in disciplines like uh, religious studies and anthropology, um, and, and in phenomenology, it comes from phenomenology, this idea of ontological bracketing, um, th- that we can put a bracket around things and then we don't have to really question whether it's real or not. Are you familiar with that idea? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, get, you don't have to ask the question anymore. You just take it you know, phenomenologically you, as it's experienced. So I think that's a good approach up to a certain point. But then when it comes to thinking about things like um, paranormal experiences and things, we want, to, we want to go a step further. Ontological bracketing is kind of another way of reinforcing this uh, binary dichotomy thing that yeah. Charles Fort really didn't like. Because we're still saying that the stuff we're bracketing off is, you know, of a different sort of stuff. It is. It, it gives it... It, it, um, it, it reinforces when it's trying to de-enforce that, that academic worldview you're trying to stand behind because you're still deciding what sort of uh, ontology this thing has rather than that thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so ontological bracketing, I mean, ontological flooding, sorry, is really supposed to be kind of like the opposite. If you could like totally get rid of all of the brackets and then this ontological flood just whoosh, takes over, 
And uh, everything, like I was saying before, everything is kind of on an equally uncertain, like, intermediatist uh, level. Does that make sense? It does. So basically yeah. you want to be um, the guy from the EPA who comes to close down the Ghostbusters and opens up <laughs> the containment unit and floods New York with all the ghosts and With demons. all the ghosts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Uh, that's basically what – either that or you need to – um, buy a few kilos of LSD and, and start um, putting it in, in the sort of teacher's lounges and academic departments around the world. And go I just and, see what happens. Uh, yeah, okay, right, right. Let the flood begin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, how is that... Uh, how has the response been to, to that kind of idea? Because there are there are a few people out there. We've had Dr. Kripal on the show, mm -hmm. um, who I love and love all his stuff. Um, yeah. So there are some people out there who are kind of going rogue and sort of saying, no, this... Um, this stuff has uh, some sort of validity, some sort of reality, and mm -hmm. where we're not modeling, you know, reality correctly uh, unless we engage mm -hmm. with that. But uh, I mean, what do you what what is your estimation of um, how much water is behind the dam wall for the flood? I mean, is is this something um, that we could hope to see among departments? Is there is there a realization that a kind of uh, materialism? doesn't even really describe material very well, let alone anything else. And so there probably does need to be a, a new framework about how we academically uh, or uh, what have you engage with reality. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't personally think that it's going to happen uh, across the board. I don't think that um, you're going to have like physicists, for example, no. um, agree into this idea but this is where you know uh, disciplines like anthropology religious studies and the humanities this is where they can really kind of thrive and i think this is the place where we're going to see if, if, if anywhere in academia this is the place where we're going to see um ontological flooding <laughs> and I, I i think about this a lot because uh i i, I love the kind of um fortean idea of, of accumulating the anomalous it's something mm -hmm. that um i kind of use as a as a talisman to ward off i don't know backsliding into materialism whatever you want to call it yeah. uh and i kind of you can you can tell that in his personality as well i think uh i'm not convinced that we need like, not that you're right, we'll never get it, but I'm not even convinced we need, at some stage, to convince Richard Dawkins that <laughs> these these phenomena are there. I think we just, yeah. it, it you can just kind of blow just, past it. Just get on with it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, let's talk about, because I, I think um, in one of the many ways um, Charles Fort was quite prescient is in, is in his idea of dominance. So yeah. do you want to talk the people through that? Yeah. This idea of dominance, again, I find it really interesting. Have you ever come across um, Thomas Kuhn's um, paradigms? Of course. Yeah, and the structure of scientific revolutions. Well, Charles Fort was kind of writing about that, that kind of stuff. When was he writing? 1919, so like 40, 50 years you know, before Kuhn was writing about it. And basically he said that there are these things uh, called dominance, which are kind of like well, paradigms, cultural paradigms. Or eons for the magicians out there. Yeah, or eons. Uh, they're, they're kind of like um, the dominant way of thinking about things for a certain amount of time. And uh, Fort said that they kind of, every once in a while, a new dominant emerges and replaces the old one. It's kind of, uh, kind of similar to um, James Fraser and um, his kind of tripartite history of human uh, thinking from magic to religion to science, um, except that Fort's uh, dominance kind of carry on beyond that. Uh, and I think well describes today's world, like because he he and he he kind of knows that the the sort of scientific dominance is uh, well, he knew that it will eventually end in a way that Fraser maybe didn't think so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and in, in another interesting aspect of it is that Fort's um, dominance kind of go in the opposite direction to Fraser's. So Fraser ends up with science and then Fort ends up with uh, witchcraft. Damn right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so I really like that idea. I think that this dominant that we're in at the moment is is just one temporary dominant and eventually 
something else will emerge after it and after it and after it and after it and so on. Well, see, I, I think it is. I don't know. Um, I do a lot of well, the last few years, uh, sort of kind of permaculture research and, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of best practice idea. But if you think about how, um, how land goes from sort of declined farmland to old growth forest, the things we call weeds in, in permaculture uh, are called recovery species because they mm -hmm. are mineral accumulators. So whatever's missing in the, in the, um, declined dirt, not yet soil, um, these plants come along and, they accumulate their minerals that the soil needs and then they die. And then, um, it's pioneer species, which are next, which is like shrubbery and the same kind of process of changing the bacterial and fungal composition as well as the mineral composition in the soil happens over a 50 to 100 year period until it gets yeah. to like all of nature is trying to be an old growth forest with sort of like a 90%, um, fungal weight in its soil going down. You could start from anything, and if we leave it alone, it turns into that. Yeah. And I kind of think these moving between dominance really, unsurprisingly for someone who's particularly interested in um, having more people take animism seriously as a model mm -hmm. of the world, yeah. I think we're past the weed stage. I think we're at the very beginning of the pioneer species stage. I think the weeds were um, a lot of the more kind of public Fortean stuff that's done the first little bit of yeah. mineral accumulation. And now we're in a situation like Dr. Kripal. Dr. Kripal is a shrub. You're a yeah. shrub, Jack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Because I, I think um, there is that sensation for people who potentially don't have the same kind of vested monetary interest, uh, interest in uh, defending the sort of first domino, to quote David Icke, seeing as we did before, which you will find in uh, physics and, and you'll find in this area is where they have to stick to what is, as far as I'm concerned, an entirely falsified paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they won't go away. It's just that we'll get shrubs and then we'll get ground cover and new trees and then we'll get old growth forest as we move into forts dominant of witchcraft. Yeah. That's a nice way of thinking about it, an organic, natural process. And, and also one that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm biased to this, but it's also one that suggests that it's the natural state. Like, basically yeah. every piece of land is trying to turn into an old-growth forest, and we either get in its way or get out of its way. Mm -hmm. And it seems like coming back to, you know, some of Fort's, well, not really conclusions, but some of the long-lived observations that he had is that yeah. this um, this range of phenomena has been phenomena in for a very long time. Yeah. Like this is this is probably the natural functioning of the universe. Yeah. And so I think the witchcraft dominant is the old growth forest, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. But I think there's probably, again, like the witchcraft dominant will eventually give way to whatever's beyond that as well spacefaring witchcraft dominant that's <laughs> yeah. what i want that's basically what i want to live long enough to see that which is in space who wouldn't you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think uh it kind of all ties in with i guess with ideas of um you know the evolution of consciousness and all of this kind of stuff the natural yeah. state eventually kind of kind of way and and that would be a model of uh, of how it sort of works and i think I oh, know I'm going to turn this into a question because Dr. Kripal and I briefly spoke about this uh, when he was on the show. But Ernesto Di Martino's hypothesis about how kind of the paranormal interacts in a culture specific way. Yeah. If you want to talk to people about that, then we can um, speculate as to. Uh, no, talk to people about that because I don't want to ruin it. And then we'll speculate afterwards. Okay. So about Ernesto Di Martino. Yeah. The hypothesis yeah. of like paranormal and culture. Okay. So, yeah, I really, really like uh, Ernesto Di Martino. I stumbled across him um, with a, a little book called Magic, Primitive and Modern. I found it in an Oxfam bookshop in Bristol. And it was just around about the time that I was starting to think about this kind of paranthropology idea and about the potential of a kind of like a parapsychological anthropology I found this book and opened it up and read it, and it was like, well, there it is. It's already been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's already written it, <laughs> yeah. um, which was good. Um, and basically, his key point was that this is where we start to talk about parapsychology and things as well was that um, 
the paranormal, uh, psychic phenomena, and all these kinds of things are uh, embedded within a uh, kind of social, emotional, cultural, um, all of these kinds of networks. I guess even, obviously, even biological, all of, all of these networks of things. And his main point was that when we look at, for example, um, parapsychological experiments in the lab, what we're seeing is a total reduction of the phenomenon down to something that you can repeat in an experiment. So, for example, um, Di Martino talks about the um, Zenicard experiments, where you you know try to predict what's on the on the other side of the card. Speaking of Ghostbusters, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so he says that that is a complete and total reduction of the phenomenon that when it emerges in the real life is kind of enmeshed in, uh, in emotion and social drama. So when it really emerges in real life is, for example, when your, uh, relative or someone you love is in trouble and, uh, you have a, a kind of flash in your mind that they're in trouble and that, that they need help or, when a loved one dies, you have an apparition, these kinds of things. They're like highly charged emotional um, emotional events, really. And this is something that parapsychology is kind of missed out on. Yeah. They, so when we look... Yeah, go, carry on. <laughs> when we look at like um, the kinds of naturalistic uh, paranormal experiences that are reported, their they're kind of intensity is so much more... Uh, vibrant than the kinds of things that parapsychologists uh, are talking about and writing about and getting like just above chance um, results for. So one of the things that I've taken away, I don't know if I'm answering your question or if I'm just no, we're getting that. tangenting. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I'm going, that I've been interested in is the potential of kind of like this, a new kind of anthropological parapsychology um, where we're taking we're kind of becoming aware of this um, enmeshedness of the paranormal. And we take our like, kind of like quest to understand psi phenomena out of the laboratory and back into uh, real life. It's obviously, it's a little bit more difficult than just, you know, going out into the field and doing experiments. You have to understand the kind of cultural, the social uh, nuances of the people that you're interacting with. But I think that's probably a very fruitful way forward for parapsychology i think thankfully it is beginning to kind of emerge in parapsychology i know that there's a um the next uh parapsychological association conference uh this year there's um a whole panel session on this kind of new kind of social um participatory approach to the paranormal uh, so it is it's emerging naturally. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a pioneer species. I, 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 com I completely agree, and I want to kind of widen out the implications of that because um, particularly with the Zena cards, they, they only get above chance to start with, and, and the more you do it in, in a laboratory environment, it, it slides back down to chance. And, and parapsychology has yeah. had um, almost 100 years to model that efficiently and i don't i mean you can find people who speculate on it but i don't really mm -hmm. think they have uh, and my impression is it's kind of like you you've trapped tinkerbell under a beaker and eventually the oxygen yeah. or, or whatever fairies breathe runs out and it dies um yeah. now so not only did dimartino um kind of front run para anthropology as far as i'm concerned he also front ran the popular kevin costner film field of dreams <laughs> because the implications for this and this is kind of what dr kripal and i were talking about is that uh cultures that don't have a wide enough cosmology to include fort's idea of witchcraft mm -hmm. have less impressive and less common paranormal experiences yeah uh, which is why, I mean, I kind of think, uh, in, in well, I don't, I don't actually believe this, but half the time I wonder if all of, uh, of Western magic wasn't just to borrow a term from Elon Musk, a bootloader to get to Brazil, because it's there where it all washes up and they've got UFOs and, and they seem to be creating a world religion every week and, yeah. and so on. But it, it, within that culture, you have, uh, more open, much more openness to to the paranormal, which means they have more paranormality and better paranormality than we get in Islington. Yeah, 
And uh, that interests me about De Martino, and it also suggests kind of going back to the recovery species metaphor or pioneer species. Mm -hmm. The more of this that escapes the lab and the more people that get to actually hold up these um, like anomalous uh, Fortean experiences yeah. to wider culture, then the more people may or may not be able to say whether that matches their experience. And, and, and so the shrubbery grows. And I think yeah. Di Martino was quite uh, like really smart in, in, in seeing yeah. that and actually seeing that. And it, you, like we approach a model for how ritual magic works when we really think about what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that's another thing, like this whole uh, ritual uh, performative participatory kind of thing. This is where I think parapsychology needs to to go. Uh, looking at you know psi effects in rituals and using rituals as a way of you know doing their experiments. Uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be you know like uh, rituals in the Amazon jungle or anything. Like it could be. Well, I mean, spiritualism is the perfect example. Uh, if only we would go back to that more kind of like the early psychical researchers, and they were reporting some pretty crazy stuff yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they were doing these, you know, seance rituals. It's just as kind of parapsychology and psychical research have had to like scientificify themselves, they've lost the phenomena. Absolutely. That, yeah. um, that was a bad trade. It happened with psychology and magic. It happened with parapsychology and magic. Everyone mm -hmm. kind of played dress ups with what they thought an adult was supposed to look like uh, yeah. and hope that their, their, you know, department would live another year. And that kind of defines 60 years of the 20th century. And it's really embarrassing because you do have to go back to Fort and Di Martino and Jung and the yeah. 19th century to find people who are actually um, bold enough when it comes to their own kind of, not even convictions, but bold enough to stand by their own data. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> and now, and, and we haven't. And uh, it's, and this is what I mean. I think um, I'm, I'm broadly positive. I have no idea it's going to be the last question, so um, you can prepare for it. I, I'm broadly optimistic that this is in fact happening in that um, pioneer recovery species sort of yeah. way right now. Mm -hmm. But so that's kind of like the, the final question: How do you? Um, how would you like to see the sort of respective humanities departments flooded? Okay, uh, this is this is a good question again. And it, when I was when you were talking, then I was, it just had this um, recollection of something that else that I wanted to talk about, and it thankfully it does kind of tie into this. Sweet, we can meander again. That's, that makes <laughs> yeah. for a good podcast. Um, so one of the things that uh, I wanted to try and do with the journal with paranthropology was to kind of was to provide a platform for um, anthropologists um, who had had strange experiences themselves to uh, you know to be able to talk about their experiences. Paranthropologist Anonymous. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, I've, I've written a few articles about this kind of like increasing or gradual development of kind of increasing reflexivity in anthropology starting off with um people like eb tyler in the 19th century um who you know developed a notion of animism to begin with and how he this is again this is interesting we were talking about the um how we have to go back to the 19th century to find people who were willing to talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah, just but courage also, for their data. Carry on. Yeah, yeah, but it's also the place where the, the kind of shutdown started off. Mm -hmm. um, so E.B. Tyler is a really good example because in his all of his public writings, he was basically a proponent of the shutdown perspective. He was saying all of this stuff, all of animism is basically just uh, delusion. It's primitive. It's been superseded by scientific rationalism and all of these kinds of things. Um, but then at the same time, he was participating in, um, spiritualist seances with, with the likes of like D.D. Hume and, um, Kate and Margaret Fox and like the, the big players in, in spiritualism at the time, uh, Stanton Moses. And, um, in his private diaries, he talks about how, um, he'd had these seance experiences. Some of the experiences had been, you know, he'd kind of dismissed and they weren't impressive and others had almost certainly convinced him 
that there was some kind of a, a kind of like a psychic force is what he talked about. And yet in his public uh, writings, um, there's no mention of that. Uh, I think it comes back yeah. to the idea of kind of trying to protect anthropology as a science. Like he didn't want to bring that stuff in. He wanted to elevate it, you know, not really elevate it, but you know what I mean. And funnily enough, there was a uh, a conference about uh, sort of Freud art, well, um, psychotherapy, art and the occult in London the other weekend. Mm. And it was mostly delving into Freud's experience with an understanding of the occult because the, since the publication of the Red Book in particular, people kind of associate of the two great um, sort of founders of psychology, uh, Jung more with the occult for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, but Freud had the same kind of what I view as a betrayal, which is in a desperate attempt to get psychotherapy to be taken seriously as a big boy science. Yeah. Because um, he, he did the same thing. He dismissed it all. And in the meantime, he and his daughter and his um, son-in-law were doing like telepathy experiments. And yeah. he was a member of the SPR. And he had the same thing in his stuff. He's like, uh, and interesting, that kind of ties with what DiMartino was saying. He noticed that what he called thought transference, uh, what mm -hmm. he called rather thought transference, um, happened with increasing regularity and reliability just at the point in therapy where people were kind of um, surfacing and working through their trauma. Yeah. So again, you have this kind of um, non-clinical experience to do with healing and uh, and all that kind of stuff that you know, Di Martino and, and what we we're just talking about predicting yeah. is um in 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 a natural environment, um these psi psi effects are are more common. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of I'm still disappointed in the people who came afterwards that they didn't actually see what they were trying to do there because in many respects the world is better off for things like um psychotherapy and and anthropology and, and that's all good. But we just yeah. kept pretending that this is science and this isn't for, I yeah. think, far too long. Yeah, definitely. And this, this comes back to, um, you know, this, what, what, the question was about... Um, how, how do, do we flood? This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how do we flood? Um, eventually, gradually, over time, anthropologists are beginning to kind of open up about their own kinds of uh, paranormal experiences in the field. So like I was saying, I've written a few articles that kind of trace, like starting with Tyler... Uh, going onwards through people like um, Andrew Lang, who was really interested in the pos basically in in um, the experiential source hypothesis that David Hufford has kind of taken on. Um, on through him to people like um, Bruce Grindle, uh, who's quite a prominent anthropologist um, in the 1960s, and he reported. It, it took him 20 years to report this crazy experience that he'd had. Um, of seeing a corpse reanimate and drums playing themselves and things. Uh, he had the experience, I think it was in 1969, and then it was only 20 years later in, 19, in the 80s that he finally published the account. And then that spurs other anthropologists on to say, well, I had a similar kind of experience. And eventually, yeah. hopefully, we'll end up in this place where actually these paranormal experiences... Um, strange occurrences and weird stuff that we experience in rituals become a part of what, uh, I guess, what ethnographic writing is, like covering all of the bases. We're not just thinking about kinship systems and all of that kind of stuff. We're moving on to, like, human experience, really. And I think that's where the flood I think yeah comes in it's a it's a it's a one drop at a time the the pioneer species um metaphor is apt i think in that respect yeah. accidentally apt because uh that is basically how it works in in research for um one of the books i had uh, published earlier this year the same thing happens when you talk to egyptologists like on yeah. mass because i mean i i kind of understand like they have a job um yeah like I don't forgive them for it because that's fine, but you get you get them individually, or you get a sumerologist individually, and um, and they're aware that there are real questions around some of um, how these things might work, or how that worked, or, or so on that they can't say publicly, but they do. You just kind of have to historically, well, in the last forty years, we've had to kind of trap academics or steal their pets and then threaten them with it to get yeah. them to talk. And it seems like, you, I, I, think you're, I think you're correct. I think how we flood is to make it okay for 
yeah. people to actually kind of study and talk about the full range of uh, phenomena rather than, as you said, um, yeah, kinship systems or um, who gets to go hunting or, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. That's it. I mean, it, it is just a making it kind of safe and okay for people to talk about stuff is the way that, <laughs> that the flooding is going to happen. Um, getting rid of those, those barriers to talking about, about stuff that for some reason we've decided or someone has decided we can't actually talk about. You see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So then for people who would like to be part of this flood, Jack, mm -hmm. um, where might they go to find out more about you and all your stuff? Okay. Uh, to find out about paranthropology, the best place to go is paranthropology.co.uk. Um, there's all of the journals are uploaded there for free. Uh, so you can download them. And then there's links to various different kinds of, uh, books and um, also print versions of the journal. Um, and then there's a Paranthropology uh, Facebook group with lots of interesting discussions always going on there. All sorts of stuff from like recent psychedelic research right through to Victorian spiritualism and all of that kind of thing. So yeah, that's probably the best way to, to go. And then there's the books. Very cool. <laughs> and the, I mean, this will all be linked up in the show notes as well. But um, uh, the book, the latest one, the latest one is The Damned, isn't it? Damned Facts, yeah. Damned Facts, sorry. Yeah. You didn't write The Damned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so wonderful. And uh, on that note, Jack, um, good luck with your own new little phenomenon. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Jack Hunter, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it occurs to me when Jack gets his PhD, he will have himself the most computer game hero name ever, and will then presumably complete his transformation into Indiana Giles. In the meantime, he's still talking paranormal anthropology, spiritualism, Charles Fort, even a little David Icke in there. If this is just the sort of audio you need in your life, then please do subscribe in iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, or on YouTube. Let me know what you thought of the show at runesoup.com, the RuneSoup Facebook page, or on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>